the field of physiology has always been a quantitative science. It means that you know, throughout history of physiology, uh, physiologists have attempted to understand living systems uh, from a quantitative perspective. Um, they've put equations, mathematical equations, uh, to their experiments or their experimental data. And very early on in the history of physiology, therefore math um, physiologists have attempted to build mathematical models of um, how living systems work, of organ systems, or the whole body. Uh, over the past few decades, uh, computational power has become very, very cheap. And storage of data has become very, very cheap and very, very um, efficient. And so we're in a position now to actually build highly detailed models of organ systems uh, from the cellular level up, actually from the genomic level up. Um, we also have a lot of data. Biomedical uh, engineering and clinical research provide a lot of data, and that data will need to be integrated in some sort of framework um, and organized in some sort of way so that we can make sense of it. And one way of doing this is what is known as the Physium Project, which means that we actually try to integrate all of this data through mathematical models of organ systems. And this is, as I said, from the cellular level up all the way to the, to the, um, to the organ level and the organism level. And as you can imagine, these are big models that attempt to uh, simulate, uh, model and simulate the uh, organs uh, on, different, on many different time scales and many different length scales. This goes from fractions of a second to uh, seconds to minutes uh, to the whole lifespan of an individual. So we have now um, developed as a field uh, very elaborate models that represent physiology on a great number of time and length scales in great many detail. And uh, these models allow us uh, then to interpret experimental data and also to provide uh, a framework within which to, uh, with, you know, within which to view um, disease processes. Uh, so we can actually use these models in a very straightforward manner. We can actually generate these models and then we can perturb parameters of these models to reproduce um, conditions that might resemble conditions that we see in pathological cases, in disease processes. And this is very important because it will allow us how individual changes and in individual parameters of the model actually affects the whole organ system. Organ systems or organs in the human body are highly complex structures um, in terms of um, three-dimensional structures, but also highly complex in terms of their function. Um, they tend to be nonlinear. They uh, interact with many other organ systems. So it's actually quite difficult to reason uh, from first principles how an organ system might respond to a perturbation uh, in you know, its uh, normal function. So these models actually allow us to uh, change parameters, to change the conditions under which uh, these models uh, are simulated, and then to learn about the organ system and to compare what we learn from these mathematical models and, uh, well, compare what we learn from these mathematical models um, with uh, data that we get from the clinical environment or from the laboratory, and therefore enhance our understanding of the system. This is on the one side, we have these big, you know, multi-scale models. Uh, on the other hand, we also have very small models. We have uh, very simple models that also represent uh, the phenomenology of experimental data. And these models are also very helpful in our uh, understanding of uh, physiological systems because uh, they're very simple and they can be understood uh, very easily and uh, they can be uh, identified, if you wish, from experimental data, meaning that there's only a very small number of parameters. And these number of parameters can be estimated or can potentially be estimated from experimental data that can be um, collected, for example, in a routine clinical setting. So we have, on the one hand, very large models that allow us to understand the structure and the function at a very high level of detail. On the other hand, we have very small models that allow us to actually estimate parameters from experimental data, from clinical data, that is um, archived 
at hospital environments or can be collected in, uh, in research settings. So both of these play an equal role because, um, because they're somewhat complementary in the way that they actually provide us with um, further insights into how uh, organ systems work and how they might work under conditions um, that are not normal, namely pathology. And so um, both might enhance our way of thinking about organ systems and how we actually, or our clinical colleagues, might actually take care of patients in the future. In building large models, there are some obstacles that need to be overcome. One is access to data. We have to have high quality access to a large number of data in order to build models at a high level of detail. And that is being accomplished in laboratories around the world uh, where targeted experiments are being done. Um, also data can be pulled in from the clinical environment. Another obstacle is computational complexity. So a lot of these models, because they spend many time scales and many length scales, are computationally quite complex, meaning that you actually need a lot of computational power to simulate the model um, and to uh, arrive at an answer to the questions that you might want to pose with these models. That can be addressed and is currently being addressed, obviously, through um, multi-core uh, processing through supercomputers. And some of these models tend to be uh, implemented on uh, large supercomputers um, just to speed up the computational cost. But there are aspects that we learn about computation uh, that comes out of these multi-scale models um, that, that are being addressed uh, in this domain. On the level of the small models, um, we really have to develop smaller models at a right level of granularity. And what I mean by this is that in order to estimate parameters from uh, clinical data, for example, we have to build models at a, at a size, if you wish, number of parameters that is appropriate for the data that we collect from the clinical environment. And it's not a priori clear how to do that. So there's a lot of experimentation, a lot of um, uh, going back and forth between larger models and smaller models to find the right size of the model so that the parameters of these models can actually be estimated from uh, clinical data, clinical data streams that can be routinely collected in a hospital setting. So there is currently a gap um, between the high granularity of the, small, of the large models and the small granularity of the small models. And we don't have a very good way of automatically going from a large model to a small model. So there's not really a mathematically a clear way or physiologically clear way of doing that. So these two worlds are somewhat disconnected the way I see it right now. And one of the, I think, challenges and opportunities for the future will be is how can we actually take a large model that represents physiology at a high level of granularity and bring it down to a um, level that the parameters of this model could actually be estimated robustly from experimental data. And that also obviously depends on the kind of data that is available, but um, it also depends on um, this translational step. How can, we actually, how can we actually go from a large model to one that, is, uh, that, that represents um, the essential properties of the system, um, but in a highly aggregate manner? So in order to achieve this goal, I think there are a few natural steps. Uh, one is that one actually takes a larger model and tries to condense it to a smaller model using the knowledge of physiology. We've done this in our work, uh, others have done it in, in different domains, but you really have to study the physiological system very carefully in order to be able to, uh, to make this translation. Another area that I think will be of, of great value is coming from, I think, the control theory and system dynamics um, literature, where people have looked at model order reduction, but they haven't really looked at it in a way that allows us to preserve the structure of the model. And that's very important here because each parameter in, the large, in a larger physiological model has interpretability. We, we interpret these parameters and, f and doctors interpret these parameters in particular ways. And we would like to preserve that interpretability. So the model order reduction 
techniques that come out of the control theory and the systems dynamics literature um, don't necessarily preserve the uh, interpretability of these parameters. That is very important if you actually want to translate these models into the clinical application because clinicians are very used to thinking in terms of certain variables. This could be a blood pressure, this could be a volume, this could be a compliance, for example. And we need to provide the clinicians with the ability to maintain that interpretability. And so I think one of the big areas uh, will be uh, structured model order reduction. Can we actually reduce larger models to smaller models in a way that actually preserves the interpretability of the parameters and the states? I'm very optimistic about the future here because the, on the one hand, we have a lot of data that's coming from the clinical environment. So much data that uh, clinicians have a hard time actually um, screening and analyzing all of the data. On the other hand, we have highly detailed representations of physiology in these mathematical models. So merging these two worlds is going to be a great challenge for the future, but it's a wonderful opportunity because we're no longer limited or we're no longer as limited as we have been in the past by computational power. So we actually do have the computational resources to be able to merge both data and modeling in real time at the patient's bedside. And we could actually think of the future as allowing us to identify models of organ systems, whether it's the heart, whether it's the lung, whether it's the liver, or it's the kidney, in real time at the patient's bedside as the data is being collected from the patient. And that, I think, will be a very powerful tool, not only to understand physiology, but also to take care of patients who are, for example, in critical care. And I think that will be very exciting and will provide novel ways of, uh, of looking not only at, at the data streams that are coming, but in novel ways of taking care of the patient. <music>